Now we'll have a reading from the scriptures, Luke 22, 54 through 65. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing him, said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And thank you, choir. Thank you, as always. Constant companion in worship every Sunday. You're there providing the beautiful music. Thank you. And so we're dealing not only with the blessing of the animals day, we're also dealing with trauma, looking at trauma in our world. It permeates our culture. It's been here since the beginning of time. It still plagues us. It plagues all of us. There's no human that gets away from not experiencing trauma. And did you know that the scriptures are all filled from beginning in the Garden of Eden to the end of Revelation in chapter 22 with trauma? Every page is trauma. We're seeing it unfold. And then what God does with that trauma. And so we're going to look at that more closely. It's appropriate we talk about trauma today even because tomorrow is Indigenous Day. And imagine all the peoples across the world that have suffered trauma at the hands of others. And so with all that in mind, let us begin with the prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, gracious God, holy God, for this day we give you thanks. And now be with us in our eyes and our seeing our ears and our hearing, our lives and our living this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. They seized him. Those are the first words in our scripture today. They seized him. They, the soldiers, the religious establishment around Jerusalem. Him, Jesus. It's Thursday evening, Monday, Thursday. He's been arrested. He's going up to the high priest's room up above the courtyard to be interrogated and then tomorrow he will be crucified. There are chapters in the Gospels describing what takes place in these days. And too often Lent goes by too quickly. We get to Easter without really realizing and taking pause to see the trauma in these stories. I thought at first, looking at this passage this past week, after they seized him, caught my attention. I thought it was only Peter that was traumatized along with Jesus. It turns out everybody in this story is traumatized. The soldiers, the priests, the servant girl, being a girl in that age and also a servant. Imagine the soldiers again, and all those who are looking on knowing what's happening, trauma just drips from the story. You may have trauma yourself. You may have experienced it at different times. You may have been gripped by it, seized by it. That's what caught my attention because I know what it's like to be seized by trauma. There's nothing I can do about it during that time of being seized by it. No one can say anything that's going to make it better. Images from past traumas just soak into my soul. Maybe it happens to you as well. 
What then helps us get out of the trauma? What takes place? What do we see in Scripture that may help us as well? What do we see that may help the world? Now, why does trauma happen? It's a complex. We had Victor Nelson earlier today at the adult day class talking about trauma. He's a trauma specialist, a therapist, a Lutheran pastor, retired now. Helped identify some of the causes. One is that trauma imprisons your mind. Something from your past jumps up at you, takes hold, and doesn't let you move imprisonment. It feels that way at times. It's, it, the brain changes. Medical studies, scientific studies show how the brain changes with trauma. It's physiological and brain is part of the body. The body responds and the body holds past trauma related events. Until you know how to release them, they're going to grip you, seize you until that time. It goes back generations. It can go back three generations, studies say. Maybe even more. How people who, let's say, had grandparents and great-grandparents in the Holocaust still suffer trauma, even though they may not even know what the Holocaust was all about. Other traumatic events that have happened to families gets passed down into the present day. And then, I just found this out by taking a course at San Francisco Seminary the past year. I graduated. I have my certificate now on trauma and spiritual care. Much of what I say from now on is going to be what I learned. But that this sometimes trauma often is intentional. That is our whole second course out of four courses was the intentional putting trauma upon people and nations by those in power, by the authoritarian leaders, by all those who put people's needs last and they struggle. When we see the story in Scripture, in the Gospels, the people in Jesus' day were hungry. They were impoverished. They were in need of something to get them out of their trauma, which was palpable. You don't think it's intentional? What is this? We have our cell phones and they keep track of us. You can't go anywhere without your cell phone or else you feel like you lost something and that you're missing something. This is keeping us held down is what my professors say. Don't let cell phones do that to you. Social media. My professors say, get off of it. Now. It's traumatizing. It's meant to be traumatizing. Cable news, meant to be traumatizing. It's addictive. You keep wanting to go back and back. A lot of our youth are having trouble. Our children are having trouble with this right now. But it's intentional. Think of all the pogroms. Think of all the ways that countries have, have invaded other countries. It's going on right now. It's trauma. It's intentional. They know what they're doing. What do we do then? The church has been part of it. For all these years, for generations, centuries, the church has done this. People are still trying to get out of the trauma of religion. So, what does this church do? What can this church become? What has this church done already? Here's what we might be able to do to help with the trauma. And I had to look through all my notes. I took a lot of notes, but I don't know about you, when I take notes in class, I'm scribbling to get it done fast so I can hear everything and I think I will know what it says when I go back to it. I don't know half of the words I wrote down. But I was looking through notes, and there it was. It said, in my writing, I could read that writing, it says, the antidote to trauma is love. That's the antidote. We talk about love a lot, we sometimes lose the significance of it. Love and compassion. But in my notes, it is the antidote. 
the trauma. Now, if you're dealing with trauma in a, a deep way and you can't get out of it, please, please go to a medical mental health professional. Please do. Get connected. Talk to me. I, I, I have resources to find other people who may be able to help you. Talk to other people who know, but do that. Don't live with it. But what we do as a church is this, I think, at least partly. My 40th anniversary of ordination is tomorrow. 1984, I was ordained into the Presbyterian Church. A long time. I look back on those 40 years and I say, here's what I think I should have done better. But here's what I think ministry is all about. Two things. <clears throat> Show up and be kind. Keep those in mind. You show up. We show up on Sunday mornings here to worship together. It's not a single private worship service. We're doing it in a community. Community is so important, especially with the pandemic, who has just knocked us off kilter. We need to be in community like this. We were told to isolate during the pandemic, and now our political divide is dividing us. We need to come together, everyone. We do so every Sunday. Show up. If someone's putting on a class or doing a course or giving a concert, show up. That's a little simple thing to do, but show up for them. And be kind. If we were as kind as we think we are, hope we are, imagine our church would be that kind place. Known across the community is a place you can go and you will receive kindness in everything we do. Be kind. Show up. Here's a third one. It may go against that some, but it doesn't really. Be prophetic. Pastors try to be and often don't feel they can be too scary, too tough. You pay our salary. But being prophetic, the prophets identified the trauma. We need people to identify trauma before we can do something about it. So be prophetic. May we all be prophetic in this world to look in those places of injustice and bring justice about. In those places of poverty and bring abundance about. In all those places that need God's love and compassion, we are those who do that. And then, we're getting close to the end, puppies. <laughs> we are, all of you, everyone. Prayer and blessings. I brought the puppies up because we're now at the blessing stage of blessing our animals because they've blessed us. And I don't mean just our pets. I mean the entire world of animals. Think twice again about what that might mean for you to bless all the animals. God created all the animals. And did you know, scientific studies show time and again that prayer is effective. When we pray, our prayer isn't just for our little spot here. Prayer somehow transports itself across the world. Don't know how it happens. But when we pray, God's Spirit is close to us. And we know God's spirit is across the world in the universe. Oh, pray. Give blessings to your animals, not only this one today, but every day. Pray for others every day. Last one. The last assignment we had was to write our future story. I've mentioned this before. I'll say it again. It's so important to write our future story, which means 
Imagine what your life will be in the future without any barriers, no divisions. Nothing's going to stop you from getting there. That's your future story. Spend 20 minutes on it and imagine. Because God has a great imagination. Imagine what God's done in the world. Taking a small group of people when there were no people, making them a people. God has a great sense of creativity, of finding out ways to free people from bondage in Egypt to our own bondages today. God has a future story for all of us. A story that does not seize us as much as invites us, grabs hold of us in whatever state we are in and says, take my hand, let us join together. Here is love and here is compassion, here's forgiveness for you. Here's a place you can be long where people know your name. Come back, show up, be kind. Love the world. Love all that's in it. That's our future, everybody. Come join us on that journey. And may blessings, oh, may blessings abound. And thanks be to God. Amen.